if you're not able to be profitable solo, hiring an employee isn't going to fix that. It's only going to make it worse. Welcome to the Small Business Sewing Podcast. This week, we talked with Robert Brenlin's husband, who runs a successful woodworking company, about how to hire help. However, we record this right after a humongous snowstorm that took out power for millions of people for several days, and they were struggling with some slow internet issues. So just to warn you, there's a little bit of problems uh, occasionally. There's also times when he has actually had to go sit in on her conversation uh, through her phone. So it's going to be back and forth. I've tried to edit out as much as possible to make it as smooth as possible. But if there's any errors in the sound, please forgive us and keep listening. This is a wonderful episode. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Small Business Sewing Podcast. Join host Kathleen, that's me, from Sunny Mountain Patterns and Brandilyn from Daily Sews and Stuff and guest experts as we discuss how to run successful sewing businesses, innovations in sewing, and ways to make more money doing what you love. Welcome back to the Small Business Sewing Podcast. I'm Brandilyn along with Kathleen and today our guest is my husband, Robert Daly. He is the owner of Daily Woodworks and the Recreational Woodworker. Robert? Why don't you tell us your story, how you got started and where you are now? Cool. Hey, so my name is Robert Daly. And like Marilyn just said, I run um, basically it's one business, but two divisions. And it, one is the daily is daily woodworks where I build custom furniture for people and we ship all over the country except Hawaii because shipping to Hawaii is horrible. Um, and then I do the recreational woodworker where I teach people how to build great furniture for themselves um and the question was how i got started yes okay so it started with my wife wanting me to make her stuff so um i don't know that's kind of a loaded question that's kind of a long story actually so backing all the way up growing up i grew up in kind of a diy household like my dad like like if there were home repairs to do, like he did it himself. We kind of grew up on a farm. So I grew up just working with my hands, doing stuff like that. I remember when I was like in sixth or seventh grade, we built all the decks and porches around our house. And that was something I did with my dad. And then once I got in high school, I started doing construction work during the summer with um, a family friend who ran a remodeling company. From skip there, ahead to where you skip ahead to, to where you started the business. Oh, uh, okay. I wasn't. You told me like you told me to start at the beginning, so I started. So you at the were beginning. you were born um, on a I I write Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you wanted, Brandon? I think it was a Thursday, actually. A Thursday, yeah, I think Thursday, it was a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um anyway so how so how i started my business okay so we're skipping ahead to starting my business okay so um so one day i walked into work this was a um job i had had for a few years and walked in it was a normal day and then at the end of the day I was informed that I no longer had a job. So <laughs> that was as a stress relief, sometimes make money on the side kind of thing um, for a couple of years at that point. So I did what anyone do, does after they get fired from a job that they weren't expecting to get fired from. I felt sorry for myself per day and then I got my resume done and I filled out like 50 60 job applications I lost track and then um, a couple days later I was just honestly sitting around bored out of my mind because I didn't have anything to do so I was like well while I'm waiting on you know a new job in my career field I'm just gonna go make up some handyman flyers and go do you know carpentry and paint people's houses and just do whatever I need to do, you know, just for like a week or two until, you know, I get a call from like a job in my career field and we move on there. And that was over five years ago. So <laughs> it's kind of taken off from there. And then I can go into more of like how I went from there to 
doing what I do now, which is only custom furniture. Yeah. To give us like a really short little bit of that, because I think there's a lot of parallels with people who start sewing businesses. You know, they, they're, they sew because it's a hobby and it's fun for them. But then one day they realize, hey, you know, I could maybe make some money doing this. Mm, okay. So sewing and building furniture is a very niche um, niche market. Like, cause I mean, I run into the same thing that y'all do is anyone can go to Ikea and buy quote unquote, the same exact thing for less than I can even buy materials for. So that's kind of one of the biggest struggles that I come across still is, um, even like in uh, my wife's craft room, we have some Ikea shelving units because, they were like 200 bucks. And whenever I priced out to build something similar, it was going to cost us like $500 just in materials. And so that's probably the biggest like struggle that comes with doing this kind of stuff. And I'm sure y'all run into it as well is, you know, fabrics as much as something at, you know, the clothing store. So really your, your niche market isn't fast fashion furniture, much like somebody who's hand making something isn't going to be making fast fashion clothing because your customer base is going to be somebody that's willing to pay for the time and quality of material and your expertise, not entirely the finished product. Exactly. But, you know, because of that, but it's a small market and in order to find and build up one, my reputation to where you know, at this point, people will seek me out of like, hey, instead of buying a $500 table from Ikea, I'm willing to spend five, $6,000 on a really high end custom table in order for them to like seek me out. That took a long time to, I guess, build up my reputation and build up um, my brand to where people don't just look at me of like, oh, this is just some guy working out of his garage, you know, as a hobby. So, I'm going to pay hobbyist prices to I'm a professional doing high-end custom work. I'm willing to pay the premium for that. Um, And yes, that's what I, that's what I want you to talk about. Like how did, how did you do that? Okay. So long story short is I had to fill in the gaps for a long time. There's what you want to do in business. And then there's what makes you money in business. And so like I, whenever I was telling my life story earlier, um, before I knew exactly what y'all wanted, when I first lost my job, I started doing like handyman, carpentry, going to people's houses, replacing doors, things like that. But I always had the dream of, I would love to only make custom furniture. And I'm sure that's kind of where a lot of other people start with this is you would love to make that handmade high-end dresses, whatever it is y'all do. I don't pay enough attention. I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) um, Like whatever it is that y'all want to do, there's, there's that ideal, but then there's, you have to fill in the gaps during that process. So part of it was I found a niche in, okay, I want to build high-end freestanding furniture, but in the process of doing my handiwork, man work, and remodels, I found a niche doing custom built-in cabinetry for people. So it's similar, but it's different. And that was kind of a niche I found that a lot of people looked for, and I was able to do that work. And then as I kept building that customer base, as I kept um, you know, doing good work, getting referrals, I was able to slowly like weed out some of those other jobs that I didn't like doing, like I used to power wash houses because it honestly paid pretty good money to go power wash houses when I was an all purpose handyman. But once I built up that client base, I was able to cut out those services that I didn't like as much and then pare it down to only doing custom cabinetry, built ins, trim packages. And then now I've pretty much cut that out as well to only do furniture. So at what point during this process, and this actually happened a few different times, but at what point during this process did you decide, okay, this is too much work for me. I need to hire help. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the hiring help thing, um, as you know, and like um, Kathleen, you don't know, but that has been a ongoing struggle to figure out and I still haven't mastered it all the way 
So I've hired a few times. A lot of times it's actually been the same person. Um, he just happened to be in high school at the time. And I've had employees, I do subcontractors, and then I outsource a few things. So um, I guess, where do y'all want to start with that of like employee? Yeah, let's go with uh, when you decide to hire an employee versus outsourcing versus having a contractor. Okay. Yeah. So when, of course, you know, like when you start any business, you are going to wear all the hats, like you're going to do all this stuff. I mean, like with y'all's podcasts, like right now y'all edit yourself, you know, whenever y'all have like a million something followers, you'll probably outsource the editing and or have in-house people. Um, as far before as a million. before a million. Okay. Um, <laughs> but when we make a million, when we're making a million dollars, there you go. That's the um, <laughs> yes. yeah. So it started with, um, like any business, you're going to have business, busy, uh, I can't say the word busy seasons and slow seasons. So what I found was in our area, we live in a uh, major college town where there are a lot and a lot and a lot of rentals, people, professors, teachers all move close to, you know, the end of, you know, end of the school year, all the houses go on the market, people are moving, people are buying. So that turned into the busy season of it was not uncommon for me to look at, you know, I'm looking at April and May and I'm already booked all the way through August. There's just more work than I can get done. On top of that, when you run a business, you have to do books, you have to schedule jobs, you have to order materials, you have to do a lot of stuff. So the first thing I did was, and I don't know if this would be the first thing I would do now, um, but the first thing I did is I just was like, I need help. I need a helper who is a warm body that I can hire to come help me do these jobs. And I really lucked out and I found um, a young man named Devin who Braylon actually babysat when he was a little boy. And he came and started working with me in the summer. And his job was what we call in the construction industry, a gopher. Um, And that is someone who goes for a hammer, goes for a ladder, goes for a paintbrush. And they just are there to basically act as the surgeon's assistant. Whenever you say scalpel, the scalpel's magically in your hands and you just keep going. And so that was the first person I hired. You kind of hit on one thing that you, you made a mistake in just looking for a warm body and it actually worked out with Devin because he was awesome. You know, you kind of went into it blindly. You kind of went into, I just need help. Let me go hire help. What would you recommend other business owners do before hiring help? What should their finances look like before that? What should they know before they go try to hire somebody? Oh, yeah. You should definitely know your finances. That's that's good. Um, so going into the employee, yes. The first employee I worked, I hired worked out great. When he went back to school the next year, I tried hiring a couple other people who were just total duds, and that didn't work out. Um, so instead of just going, uh, you know, help, I'm on help, I'm drowning are two very different things. And there's two different skill sets that you need to help you with each of those situations. I think through and define, I need this, like, are they going to only like clean up after, you know, clean up all the stuff on the floor? Are they only, their only job is to keep things organized or is this going to be a skilled person that you're going to be able to expect to at least say, cut out all your parts for your project to do assembly or do finishing. Like, what are you expecting them to do? You need to have that defined one for them because it's unfair to a potential employee to be hired for a job. And then you're like, oh, they're not doing what I want them to do. Well, you can't meet expectations that you don't know exist. So setting those out and being upfront and just addressing those elephants in the room of, I will, I expect you here at this time. If you're here at this time, that's unacceptable. You know, I tolerate this. I don't tolerate this. This is what I'm expecting. And you have to also go into it with the attitude of a teacher of recognizing that this person is a whole unique person. The way you do things isn't necessarily the way they do things. It doesn't make it wrong or right. It's just you have to acknowledge those differences 
in people. And as long as you're getting the same end result with the same, you know, parameters and standards and quality and all that kind of good stuff, then let that person still be an individual while working your processes. So that's, that's for an employee, like a W2 employee, not a contractor, right? Right. Yeah, that's, that's yes, exactly. Um, Okay. So I I heard you say that you need to have the attitude of a teacher and recognize that the hire is a unique person and might do things differently. And if the end results, including parameters and quality are there, that matters, but the the exact process might not matter quite as much. Um, And then Kathleen said that that really applied to a W-2 employee, but how about if you were hiring a a subcontractor? So I want to interject that there are people who own businesses like gar- that make garments, well, they will hire seamstresses to work for them doing like piecework or, you know, even to make a whole garment. Um, and a lot of times even they'll mail it to somebody across the country and have it mailed back to them. Mm. So think about that as, as kind of a subcontractor and, and what you might need to think about when you hire a subcontractor. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'd also do, um, subcontractors who do the same work I do with them. And with that, it's very much. So with the W2, you like, they work for you under your direct supervision. Um, they are an employee. They come, they clock in, they clock out, they follow your process. They use your tools and they do things the way you want it to do with someone that's a subcontractor. If you're going to outsource your production, it's very much, I expect this end result with this quality, how you do it, I don't care because I'm only paying you a fixed amount. And so that's something you talk about um, and you need to you know, see examples of their work to know they do a good job. Um, you need to, again, clearly defining those expectations of this is what I'm expecting the end product to look like, providing them the resources they need. So if you're, using like a special, in my case, I sometimes will have different woodworkers in the area build um, uh, dog kennels for me. That's one of my products. When I do that, I will take them the lumber and materials and I'll take them a set of drawings and blueprints, um, which I guess is the same as a pattern for y'all. And we'll talk through it. They'll ask questions. We'll clarify what needs to be clarified. And then I don't, really see or talk to them again until they call me and say, Hey, it's ready. Trust that it's taking the time to find someone who does quality work, who's willing to work for you is it's hard to do, but that's honestly the way I've started preferring to use employees in my business, which they're not really employees, but by having a skilled person do it on their own time with their own tools in their own space. Yeah. My profit margin might not be as high, but it's a lot less stressful and I don't have to worry about trying to make sure someone gets 40 hours a week to support their family. I'm just giving this other business effectively another one of many jobs that they do. Okay. So I want to, kind of dig into that for a second, but I want to say this sure. first um, to our lovely audience. We just lived through the snowpocalypse here in Texas. It's been literally a week where like most of the state hasn't had electricity and, and water and things. And so our internet is real janky <laughs> right now. And that's why the audio is so terrible. And I'm so sorry, but hopefully you guys are going to try to clean it up. Yes. Kathleen is going to do as much magic as she can. And I really hope you guys can hear what we're saying, because I think there's some really good things in this. OK, so, Robert, you sort of touched on this as you were just describing um, using a subcontractor. But because um, you said an employee will need, you know, 40 hour week and they'll work with you and use your tools and a subcontractor you don't care how long it takes them or how they do the process as long as the end result is good because they're doing it on their own. So to me, that kind of sounded like what I think you mean is when somebody's working for you and you're paying them hourly, you want to make sure that they're doing things in the most efficient way. But whenever you're subcontracting and you're paying them by the work, you don't care if they're being efficient as long as the end result is good because you're paying them by the piece. Exactly. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So you're paying someone and again, this is something to talk to a, your bookkeeper and stuff about. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of tax laws that go into defining what's an employee and what's a subcontractor. And one of those major things is dictating to them the hours they work and exactly how they do things. So that's exactly right. Like with the subcontractors I use, I'll say, I need this done by, you know, next Friday. And they'll either tell me, well, I'm sorry, I already have something scheduled so I can do the Friday after that. Or they can say, yes, I can get it done by that next Friday. And that's the expectation. How, what they do between now and next Friday is fine. It may only be a job that takes honestly two, three hours to do, but you might have to give it a little bit longer lead time than you know that this this piece of work takes about eight hours to do. With an employee, you can sit down and say, okay, Tuesday, you're making this and it's going to get start to finish and that's what we're doing. With a subcontractor, you have to build in a little bit longer lead time just because this is another business that's doing things and it's like, oh, I can have it done for you by Friday. So if they work on it five minutes a day till Friday and then their Thursday night rolls around, they're like, oh crap, I got to get this done, like a college paper, then they get it done. And if they work on it till four in the morning, then fine, like whatever. I don't care as long as it's ready by the time that I need to pick it up and it's to the quality that I need it to be at, then everybody's happy. So at that point, if you're having a contractor, there's a lot of trust going on that you're going to trust yes. that they're going to get it done in the time that they promise with a quality that uh, you guys agreed upon. Yes. Getting a new contractor, uh, don't just give them all your supplies then all at once, right? How many pieces do you give them to test out to see the quality and timeliness? So that is the hardest, like that right there is the absolute hardest thing. So I work with very few and very select uh, subcontractors. Right now, there's only two that I actively work with. I've tried others and it hasn't worked out very well because of the very things you're talking about. Um, that being said, it's just you have to network with people. You have to build relationships. Um, both of the subcontractors I use, they run their own uh, woodworking businesses. So in a lot of ways, we're competitors. However, just because you're a competitor with somebody doesn't mean you can't work together and help each other out. It can be a win-win for both of you. Um, one subcontractor I use, I know his work um, because he actually hired me first. I built stuff for him under his brand name. And so we kind of trade jobs back and forth. Um, another uh, contractor I use, um, well, backing up to the first guy, um, he is actually more in the remodeling niche, but every once in a while, you know, he'll have a slow time and he does have those W2 employees that he needs to provide 40 hours a week for. So he's willing to do jobs for me pretty much at cost to fill in his time. So his guys still get the hours that they need. Does that make sense? No, one's Sorry, I'm nodding. That. I'm nodding. I'm nodding. I'm oh, on okay. mute because my baby woke up. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. I had to, um, I had to well, test I him over. My camera off to save, <laughs> to save data. Save and stuff yeah, of, you know, our snow apocalypse. No, it makes, um, it makes total sense that you're looking for okay. people that uh, basically you're just almost like one big company that's got divisions mm -hmm. and yeah, you're, yeah. you're moving work around to whoever's slow. So whichever yep. division's got a lot of work, they're redistributing out the stacks of paper, as it were, to slower exactly. people so that everybody still has work. So even though, like you said, your profit margins are decreased, uh, you know what? 50% of $10,000 profit is better than 100% of zero profit. Exactly. That Yeah, that's gold right there. And that that's very true. Of, it's, it's stressful at first, and it takes time. And... The, the other contractor that I use that I'm happy with, um, he's a hobbyist. He's actually a professor at the local college, and he just really likes building stuff. And his hobby is woodworking, and he takes it very seriously. And he does very good work. But for him, I have to realize, like, okay, it's going to take him longer to get it done because he only really has, you know, evenings, weekends when he's free to do it. And it's probably and, not you know, critical for him to get He doesn't actually charge the... me as much because he's... He's a hobbyist. Right. He, he 
he likes the money to buy more tools. Um, That's what my dad and, and, does. You know, of course, he supports his family with it as well. And so like people like that are great for me because is I find these hobbyists who are good at what they do, they um, really like it and they just want to make some money on the side. And so it's a great resource. Now I've tried that with people and the end result was um, bad and I got to redo it. Um, So that was, that was disappointing, but I've been very careful and very lucky about taking the time to find the right person instead of just finding a person. So how would you go about find, like, say you needed to find a new contractor. How would you go about finding one right now? Like what steps would you take? I would probably go to Instagram. Um, and I know that's, that probably sounds really weird, but. No, no, I um, understand. Yeah. You have to go to where the community is. So the is community of, of makers, yeah. right? Not the community of consumers. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to look at woodworking groups that I'm in. Um, cause I'm in a ton of woodworking groups. I follow tons of other woodworkers on, um, Facebook and Instagram, things like that, just because it's nice to like, see what other people make. It's nice to show off what you make to other woodworkers and that, that community is valuable and, you know, doing searches, figuring out like, Hey, this guy is in the same town as me. That's awesome. Um, yeah, we might be competitors, but like I've said earlier, like it's, I'm not into like, this is my competition. I have to crush them out of existence. I'm like, Hey, this is my competition. Let's compete. Let's like, I want to like, sure. I want to win, but I don't have to destroy you to do it. Like I can, we can work together and we can both win. Um, and so that's kind of the attitude I've had with it. And so I'll just reach out to these guys and just be like, Hey, I'm Robert Daly. This is Daly Woodworks. Um, one of my biggest products is dog kennels. And that's probably the thing I have the most defined. And so remind me to talk about defining your processes in just a second. Um, so I'll just reach out to these guys because I've seen their work on Instagram. I've seen it on Facebook. Like I already know based on the pictures they do and my interactions with them that one, they do good work and two, they're people I want to work with. I mean, I'm sure y'all come across this as well of, wow, this person does really great work. They do fantastic work, but I don't want to be in the same room with them. And that's kind of with anything is I would, I want to find people that I can have relationships with that we can work well together. Obviously there's got to be room for feedback. There's got to be room for criticism. All that can be done with respect. All that can be done with the attitude and mentality of the teacher. But that that's how I find the people to subcontract for me. As I look in my networks and I find people that one do great work, seem to have a passion for it and have the character of someone that I want to work with do you ever find yourself finding a okay, subcontractor so, that's so good that you're like wait wait i need to learn how you did that <laughs> okay um <laughs> this I'll is answer off question first both of you started talking at once so yes um that has happened many times you have to promise not to tell anybody this um confession like i'm i'm not the best woodworker in the world i love what i do it's really sad that this is not visual right now <laughs> yeah Um, but I'm, I'm not the best woodworker in the world. And I have come across people who are absolutely better than me. That's awesome. Those are the people I want to hire to do my stuff for me. You always have to be willing to learn. Like you are never going to be the greatest at your craft. Like there is, okay. So for example, um, a few years ago, I had a, a different temporary employee um, he worked for me after school a little bit. So just a high school kid, he'd come clean up the shop, um, do some things. His dad happened to be a general contractor. One day we were doing something and he did something like that. I just like caught out of the corner of my eye. It's like, Holy, what was that? What that was weird. And then he showed me what he did. And it's like, Oh my gosh, I had no idea that could be done that way. That is brilliant. And he had no idea. It was just the way he thought to do it. And so this was a 17 year old kid who, you know, worked for me for minimum wage after school on the afternoons, who I learned something from. You can learn something from anyone. And that's why I big like, if you do hire employees is you have to empower them to be themselves while following your processes, because there's always room to improve those processes. So yes, with other woodworkers that I've come across, um, I've gone to their shops, hung out with them for a day. They've come to my shops, hung out with me for a day. 
We talk about the way we do things. We talk about our processes. One of the con- subcontractors I use now, um, I've gone to a shop and helped him rearrange, reorganize, set up to be more efficient. And then he's helped me do the same in my shop. And, you know, like I said before, we're kind of sort of competitors. And it's just, we can learn from each other. Backing up just a little bit, because that was really okay. good. But I was, my brain was on a whole different track. You so you talked about the process for finding a contractor. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talked about the, the process of finding a contractor and just looking for somebody who does good work because they're with a subcontractor, you're going to want them to already know how to do the work. But with an employee, it's a little bit different. So going, taking into account all of the things that you have learned through all the different employees that you've hired, um, what, if, if you were going to start tomorrow to go look for an employee, what would you do? What are some things that you've learned? What, you know, we said earlier that somebody needs to know their finances first, but what does that mean? What do you need to know? What do you need to do okay. before you go hire an employee? So, yeah, so there, that's, um, kind of three parts. And so we'll break it down to those three parts. So we'll cover, if you're going to start tomorrow, figuring out what kind of, that you're going to go hire an employee. Um, you need to know your finances. You need to know what they are going to do specifically. And you need to define the skills that that employee needs to, to have. So let's go into finances. And this goes into outsourcing things. And I'll get into that to a second. The absolute first person you should hire if you plan on doing this as a full-time business is a professional bookkeeper. Like that is a, something I didn't do and until about a year ago, I had heard every business podcaster I've been on. And now I'm one of those people apparently on podcasts telling you to hire a professional bookkeeper. So that is the very first thing that you need to do if you're going to do this full time to grow a business. Now, a lot of you and a lot of woodworkers are kind of hobbyists on the side. And that might probably doesn't warrant a professional bookkeeper, but you need to have at least bookkeeping software. You need to have, you know, QuickBooks. There's a few other ones out there that I've used, but you need to have like the real software to keep up with your books because you need to know your numbers and know if you can even afford to hire someone. And I'm sure you remember this of all the times I've hired someone that has made more money than we have. Yeah, that was one of those okay. mistakes that you made. What did you learn from them kind of question? That, that was one thing. Because I didn't know my numbers, because I was focused so much on the, oh my gosh, I need help. Oh my gosh, I need help. And didn't think through the how, why, and what. It really ended up biting me in the butt a few times. And I had to let go some good employees because of, because I didn't have my finances lined up first. So, and that goes into processes too. So when we get to like the job description, remind me to talk about processes. So, but so how would somebody know their finances? How, how would they know if, I mean, cause yeah. it's so, not just, do I have money at the end of the month? At what point is it secure to hire a full-time employee? Right. And, and that goes to knowing your numbers. The way I price everything is how many hours does it take to produce this thing? I add materials to it and then I add a profit margin to it. That is like, that's the math for every single project I do. That's kind of where your numbers start knowing your numbers of like in my area, the average contractor or the average carpenter, like skilled carpenter working for a company makes about $30, $35 an hour. So that's like kind of my starting point on how I price my work. And I'm getting there. So it's just, it's it's a simple, and please feel free to interject if I need to clarify something. Um, so starting with your finances, of you've, you've got to know that. Um, I've seen so much bad pricing advice on the woodworking Facebook group. So I'm about to do a video about that on my YouTube channel. And I did it wrong for years. And I'm not going to say I'm doing it 100% right, but I'm doing it the way my business coach <laughs> tells me to do it. Um, it's every job, no matter what you're doing, what, whether I'm looking at a backpack right here. So if it takes you 10 hours to do a backpack, it takes you 10 hours to do a backpack. What is your time worth an hour? Like that's where you've got to start. So like if it takes 10 hours to make a backpack, then, okay, are you going to pay yourself minimum wage? Well, that's $70, $72 right there. 
Is that minimum wage seven twenty five? Yeah. So that's seventy two dollars and fifty cents right there to make that backpack if it takes you ten hours to do it at minimum wage. Then you have to add in your materials. Then you have to have a profit because if you're just paying yourself, you're not having money set aside for taxes, overhead, new sewing machines, new equipment, and you know all the things that it takes to run a business. So the first employee that you hire in your business is yourself. So you have to treat yourself like an employee of your business that works for an hourly rate. And that's the first step of knowing your numbers. Once you start doing that is, okay, are you worth $10 an hour? Are you worth $15 an hour? Like, What are you worth an hour? You have that down. Then you can decide, okay, you make, I make custom cabinets. I make uh, dog kennels. I make tables. How long on average does it take me to produce each of those things? So I have to know that for my dog kennel furniture that I build, it takes me 24 man hours start to finish to build one of those. So I've got to take my materials. I've got to take what I pay myself as an employee. The way that um, we talk about it in um, my business group is what do you pay your family? What do you pay your wife every for every hour you work? Because it's really easy to look at like, oh, well, I pay myself. I'm charging you know, $35 an hour. That's awesome. Well, that's your gross. That's what you're charging by gross. Once you take out taxes, self-employment taxes, your overhead, um, you've got equipment that breaks, that has to be repaired, all that stuff, then you might only be taking home $10 an hour of that. And so you've got to look at all those numbers. By, by doing that, I know this is what it costs me to produce this. And then I add a profit margin to it. The way I do it is I take my labor and materials and I double it. And that gets me a 50% um, gross profit margin. Once you take out your overhead, like you're renting a shop space, the electricity, I have insurance I've got to pay. I've got taxes I've got to pay. I have tools that need that wear out. I've got, you know, the consumables that you have. Like once all of those go through, then I have my net profit left over after everything else gets paid. And then that net profit is, you know, a bonus for myself every once in a while where we get to go on a vacation. Um, that net profit covers, hey, this tool random, this tool that I thought was going to last the rest of my life exploded. And so now all my net profit has to go to fixing my crappy Ford truck. And like that's that's how what you you've got to know those things before you can hire someone. And and that's, that's a long circular way to get there. So once you know that of, okay, I pay myself 20 bucks an hour to work for my business. It takes me 24 hours to build this thing. Okay, well, I'm going to hire an employee and I'm going to pay them $15 an hour. And now I have to train them to build this thing in the same 24 hours that it takes me. So for that first however long it takes based on their skill level, you have to train them. So, you know, you're probably losing all your profit there, but once they get trained and you're like, Hey, go build this thing. Well, maybe it takes them 30 hours, but because now instead of that $20 an hour, you're paying yourself, you're paying them 15, your profit margin ends up being more. Are y'all following me? Cause y'all are really yes. quiet. Yes. yes. But you we, can also we leave ourselves on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. So when you hire an employee, even though they're working, they might be working slower than you because they're not used to the process or they're, they're not as uh, good a technician as you, you are gaining capacity to make more product if you're so busy. Yes. So in essence, you're actually expanding how much money you can make because again, 50% of a $10,000 profit is better than 0% of a hundred percent of zero profit. Exactly. So you know, yes, I'm, I'm paying them. And so maybe my gross profit goes down a little bit. Um, maybe but it you're goes making up more units. Them. Yeah. But I'm making more units. So now in that same 24 hour period, I can produce two units instead of one unit. And that's the goal of increasing your capacity, but you also have, you know, you have to have the shop space to do it, which is why I kind of go the subcontractor route because, um, my wonderful wife demanded, a certain amount of my shop space to be her craft room so she could sew stuff. And I had to sacrifice yeah. graciously some of my shop for her to have a sewing room. Mm -hmm. And and now we're buying a new house to buy you a bigger shop. So, you know. Um, Your wife so, sounds so like a very lovely person. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Something that so, you kind of skipped over, but I think is really important to say. Okay. Um, is that sometimes, sometimes you have to be, well, not sometimes, all the time, you have to be prepared to take a little bit of a hit at first whenever you mm-hmm. hire an employee. It's not going to immediately make you more money. You're going to have to train them and get them to the point where they're helping you make money. Right. So right. an employee, there's costs involved. Yes. Or there, any there's costs involved. Yeah. Um, so what you said is they're not going to make you money immediately. And that is something that is very important. If you're not able to be profitable solo, hiring an employee isn't going to fix that. It's only going to make it worse. And that is... I think that was a mistake that you made. And that's a really yes. common mistake in the sewing world too. Right. I need, I need to make that our, our begin intro uh, quote. <laughs> that was really good. Oh. Wow, I said something yes. quotable. All my life I've been waiting for this moment. I thought it'd be yeah. more dramatic. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the mistakes I'm, I made a lot of. I'm super busy. I need help. I can't get all this work I'm done. I'm not making any money. If I hire someone, I'll magically make money. That's not how it works. And it's now like, I'm pretty much solo and I make really good profit on stuff because now, now I know my numbers it. and now, I, yeah. Get help. And Go ahead. It's, it's almost like, you know, those couples who are having a really hard time, like they're fighting all the time and no, they decide to have a child. No, no, I'm, you probably heard of this where they decide, oh, we'll have a child that will make everything better. Clearly those people have never met children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, um. No, no, I have. I, anyway, that's a side story. But okay. I've heard the quote where it says hire slow, fire fast. Mm hmm. It's better to have no one than the wrong person. And that is something like I I have hired the warm body before. Yeah, hire, uh, hire slow, fire fast. Um, I have definitely made a mistake of not um, hiring slowly. And I would say the work that you can do, it's better to be solo and not have anyone than working for you is like the worst possible thing because it's a make your life more stressful, reduce the quality of your work, provide poor customer service. And it's just, it's going to be bad for everyone involved, even for that employee, because if they're not a good fit for your company, then they need to be free to go find the place that they fit. Um, Had people work for me that, you know, woodworking just wasn't, and I had to let them go, but they were actually good people. So I gave them a reference for a job they applied for and then caught up with them like a couple of years later and they're thriving. They're doing great. They found what suited them. So if it's just, you need somebody and you need a warm body, it's going to backfire on you. So it's better to be over capacity, overbooked, have more work than you can produce than it is to hire the wrong person. And whenever you're alone, because you're just going to be desperate to find someone. If you so how do you know your numbers worked out if you have your finances solid? <laughs> Y'all both ask the question at the same time. Y'all gotta like flip a coin and, ask it and figure out which one's gonna talk. We can't see each other. We can normally look yeah, at each other and, and there's a horrible <laughs> delay too. So that's part of it. I was going to ask, how do you know when you've made a bad hire? So how do you know when you made a bad hire? Uh, I've learned to just kind of trust my gut of give them. I mean, you have to give someone time to learn. And if you're not going to hire with the attitude of a teacher, then don't hire because anyone you hire is going to have to be trained. Okay. So, and most of us, if we're going to hire an employee, we're not going to hire a master craftsman because that master craftsman's probably already got a new job. So you're going to hire someone who's relatively new to your trade and you have to go in with that mindset. And that's why it's really important to have your processes defined. Um, earlier, I talked about what, how I knew it took 24 hours to produce one of my dog kennels. Well, I broke it all out into each individual step and I timed each individual individual step. So I know it takes 90 minutes to take a tabletop out of the clamps, get it completely sanded, ready to stain. Um, I know that's how long it takes. So I can take that employee and go like, 
this is the time we're trying to meet. This is the quality we're trying to meet. This is how you do it. Now show me you doing this. Okay. It took you, you know, two hours. Okay. It took you 30 minutes longer than it takes me. Okay. Why did it take 30 minutes longer? Were you goofing off on your phone? Was it you're getting the hang of it? Okay. Let's do it again. And the next time, you know, they got down to, you know, a little bit better. And the next time it's a little bit better. And so are they making improvements to meet your standards of production? And if they're not able to do that, or they can't pick it up after the second or third time, then, okay, that's probably not a really good fit. So talk about knowing, talk about knowing your procedures. So you talked, you talked about knowing your process, but you also need to have procedures and policies that all kind of work together to have a good employee. Yeah. So I don't have any kind of policies set up because I never ran that kind of business. Um, so I didn't have like an employee handbook because it was normally just me and one employee. Like the handbook is, I don't like that. Stop doing it. Not, not a hey, C paragraph C section five of the employee handbook on your, you know, your code of conduct. He's making fun of me right now because uh, one of the things that I did in a past job and do in a volunteer job now is write the policies. And I kind of love doing that and making all these 5C notations. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have uh, like a whole contract when we started co-hosting <laughs> that we spent like two hours on the phone hashing out between the two of us. And it's just the two of us. Yeah. And so that's, that's really good though. And that's the way you should do it. And so that's kind of where the way I do it's not necessarily the way you should do it. It's just the way I do it. And if I was to hire someone today, going back to that job description of don't just hire a warm body, be able to define what it is you're going to do. So if I was going to hire an employee today, it would be, okay, your job is one, keep the shop space clean. Two, keep all the tools put where they go. You know, three, your job is to do this step of our overall construction process based on the skill set they have. So if I'm going to hire, you know, the 15 year old kid after school to do stuff, I'm not going to put them on a table saw. I'm going to have them sweep in the floor, vacuuming up. Um, you know, there's a verse in the Bible. If you can be trusted with a little, you can be trusted with a lot. Um, and that proverb just applies of, okay, can they do this small task and do it well so that I can start giving them more and more responsibility and then give them a way to move up in my company? Because with more responsibility should also come more pay. So we're supposed to remind you to go through your process uh, as we finish this mm -hmm. up. So. Okay. So um, the process is just um, defining the way you do stuff. Like, let's see. And so I'm just going to break it down to like how I build things is, okay, my first step is, you know, you have to get the lumber out. You need seven boards to make this tabletop. So you pull out your seven boards you have to define like, okay, you have to check these for defects. You have to check and make sure they're straight. You have to make sure there's no cracks in them. You know, that's step one. Step two is we take it to the edge joiner. This is how you, you get a straight edge on it. This is how you prepare it to be, to go to step three. And then you just have to define those steps. And then you can define, okay, step three should take 10 minutes. And then if you find out step three is taken 45 minutes with your employee, then you know, we have a problem here that needs to be corrected. And so that allows you to measure how your employees are doing. And then if it turns out like your employees, like, Hey, if we make this change, we could do it in five minutes. Then it's like, Hey, that's awesome. But by having that defined, you can improve and you can also hold everyone accountable. If it's just do this thing. And then you're like, ah, oh, that took too long. Why did it take so long? Okay. How did like, okay. How are you supposed to, do that work faster well no you have to define the process of step one is this step two is that step three is that it should take this long and by defining that and knowing how long it takes then you can be like okay how do we save a minute off of that if it takes 15 minutes how can we do it in 14 minutes how can we do it in 10 minutes how can we do it in five minutes without losing quality 
So we actually have a whole episode on this uh, called what is benchmarking and how you can yes. use it. So Brandlin and I talked about it because I'm actually an industrial uh, engineer. So that's my jam. So she, Brandlin was like, oh, yeah, my husband's yeah. doing all of this. He had it all measured out. Yeah. And like you have to put uh, things out and make things more efficient. This is exactly what we're talking about. That's the technical definition um, of right. benchmarking is finding out what you're doing, how long it's taking, and then figuring out ways to improve it and measuring the changes against the original. Exactly. And I, I know it is lean manufacturing and that's kind of what i've studied of it so it seems very similar it's just called something different in the books i've read oh yeah lean manufacturing is is we we talk about this for like an hour and a half but yeah lean manufacturing is benchmarking um it's just there's a whole bunch there's six sigma lean manufacturing ace a whole range because everyone's interested in making more money for less amount of time yeah and so that's that's this conversation you and i can like nerd out over all by ourselves one day because um, that that's something I'm in on. And Two Second Lean by Paul Akers is a great read this book for anyone getting into producing things for money. Um, he does it from a very high level, easy to read um, overview, but that's just a very high level overview of manufacturing. And I would look at reading that book or listening to the audiobook. It's only like a three hour audiobook. Um, very high level, very, you know, not getting into the nitty gritty, you're not, you know, you're not going to be an industrial engineer by the time you finish this book, but you're going to know like the ideas and the processes of manufacturing. Kathleen will, cause she's already an industrial engineer. Right. That's why I use that term. So I think maybe this is a sign that it's time to wrap things up. So um, why don't I ask you the four questions here, Robert? Robert. Yes. Uh, you have to let me yell in your ear oh, because that's okay. how the microphone is working. Okay. okay so do we want to talk about outsourcing? didn't talk about outsourcing at all. Oh, yeah. Before we wrap things up, let's talk about outsourcing. So I know you outsource your bookkeeping and you you sort of said that earlier, but talk about how you decided to outsource, why that might be a better option than employee or, or um, subcontracting and what sort of things you might think about outsourcing. Yeah, so outsourcing is different than subcontracting. And, and in my mind, it's really honestly the same thing, but I define it differently. Um, just to keep it right in my head. So in my mind, subcontracting is hiring someone to do something that you could do. Just they're a different company. You hire them to do it for you. At the end. Outsourcing is getting things off your plate that you aren't good at. So one of the things that I do is I have a bookkeeper who does all of my bookkeeping, all of my taxes. She's wonderful. I don't have to worry about that anymore. And the money gets to the IRS, the money gets to me, and everything's happy. It's wonderful. So I outsource that off my plate. Another thing I outsource is I do with the recreational woodworker is I do a ton of content creation. We produce one video a week on our uh, YouTube channel. I have a video editor who edits all my videos for me. And that is something I love to That's have. the dream. Yes, that's the dream because I don't have to sit in front of a computer all the time. And guess what? That's what he does for a living. And so I pay him on a per hour basis of however long it takes him to edit that particular video. And then I don't pay him again. So I have another video for him to edit. But he does it, honestly, cheaper, faster, better than I can. Because if I'm factoring in how long it takes me to edit a video and what my time is worth, he's able to do a better job editing in half the time. Um, something else that I've just done is I reached out to a graphic designer of I need branding and logos for you know Facebook. And yeah, I could download Canva. I could pay the monthly fee for it. Or I can just email my graphic designer and say, hey, I need these things, make them for me. And she'll do a good job on it. I don't have to learn a new program. I don't have to learn a new skill because I'm old now and I don't like learning new things. But that gives me uh, the ability to get things off my plate that make me able to focus on the things that I'm good at. So if I'm really good at working in the shop, recording the videos. So the less admin stuff I have to do and the more I can get off my plate, the better. So it's, I mean, getting supplies that are pre-made too, is almost like outsourcing. Like you're not going to make your own zippers if you're making backpacks, probably actually That's, can't, uh, you, you know, you're probably not making your own nails. I would imagine. 
<laughs> and people do. No, I don't. They're like super nerds. They, yeah, make like, they hew their own wood. They harvest it from the forest. Like we're, we're yeah. not doing all that. <laughs> exactly. Like, I mean, I mean, and if you think about it, that's, that's very true. You're not, you know, starting with, with cotton and making your own fabric. So everyone outsources to an extent. Um, but yeah, and that just makes life easier. So you can focus on what you're good at. Like, um, I have a friend, he runs a lumber mill. He goes, cuts down the trees from people's lands A very small, he's a, you know, kind of like us. He's a small, super small business started kind of as a hobby that he now runs at his business. He'll go like cut down, like you have a dead tree in your front yard. He'll cut it down, mill it into useful lumber. Like that's super interesting to me, but that's not something I I'm going to do. I'm not going to invest that $20,000 in equipment to go cut down trees. I'm going to let him do it for me. And then we both win. And then I build my network because he will then give refer customers to me who want to take the tree from their front yard and turn into an awesome table. Right. And then you can do mutual things for your YouTube channel and be like, oh, we're going to go tour a mill. And you don't actually have to be the one running the mill to do the tour. Exactly. Exactly. Let's ask the four questions. So Robert, what is your favorite time-saving tip? Hmm. My favorite time-saving tip is to spend money on those dream tools that save you lots of time. No, no, no. You can't, you can't get Brandilyn to agree to letting you buy a new Roby, okay? <laughs> or a new planer. Okay. That's not fair. How's that not fair? <laughs> My dad does this all the time. He's a woodworker too. And he's like always yeah. trying to get my mom to let him buy new tools. <laughs> but I mean, I think the biggest time-saving tip is um, probably just organization. Um, we talked a little bit about the, you know, lean thing. I do like it's simplified the three S of sweep, stort, sweep sort standardize like go through like keep your space clean get keep everything in your put in you know the right slots buckets bins and then standardize how you do things um like if you do something the same way every time you can measure it and improve it so sweet sort standardize would probably be my number one time saving tip so how do you price your products um, I price my products um, basically time plus materials times profit. So if it takes me 10, o- 10 hours to produce something and I'm going to charge and I'm worth $10 an hour, then that's $100. If materials cost you know $50, that adds up to be $150 that in cost of goods sold. That's what costs me to make this thing. Well, then I add my profit to it. So I would mark it up. In my case, I multiply by two. So that would mean it cost me $150 in labor and materials to produce this. I would charge $300 for it. And then I take out you know, my overhead, things like that. And then I'm left with a net profit. All right. So what do you automate? Hmm. So automation is something I kind of do that's kind of goes with the outsourcing of, you know, at first, you know, we live in a time where there is software for everything and it's wonderful. So I automate, you know, my invoicing system, my bookkeeping system, all that was as automated as possible before I outsourced it to someone else. But my invoicing system is one of the best things that I automate. I have a great software um, that I what use. What is it? It's called Market. It's basically Market with an E on the end of it. Um, so all of my um, invoicing estimates, uh, that manage is my customer list. I can send emails from it. I can build a price list within that, and then I can take payments online with it. So I can send an estimate out. It'll send the customer a text message and an email. They can pull it up right from their phone, pay it right from their phone, and it just makes that whole process easy. And then I can keep up with, oh, I have this many estimates that I haven't heard back from, so I need to call up for it. It can send out automated emails of like, hey, you know, your payments do, or, Hey, we're getting close to starting your project and having that automation just frees up a lot of time. And I don't lose track of things because I'm extremely global and that will get her on a tangent. (laughs) Yeah. Let's not though. Um, where can people find you? The best place to find me is the recreationalwoodworker.com. 
Um, that's kind of become my main site. I'm also, if you do at the Recreational Woodworker on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, I'll come up. Every week, we try to ask questions for our audience to come and talk to us about in our small business sewing community. And this week, I came up with two questions uh, for our audience. So if you have hired help, what are your tips to add to what Robert has said? And if you haven't hired help yet, but you think you're ready, what's holding you back? So this has been Kathleen with Sunny Mountain Patterns and Brandon with Daily Sews and Stuff asking Robert Daly from the Recreation Woodworker on how to hire help. I hope you have a great day and I hope uh, those two are staying warm right now because it is freezing at their house. 